we're going to get tired of dunking on AI, where someone like you or someone like me will listen to some foolish statement, whether it's Devin or the CEO of NVIDIA, and we're like, I'm going to spend a couple hours so I can dunk on this knucklehead, right? These people, you know they're wrong. You know they're wrong. And I just don't think it's worth my time or your time to dunk on every knucklehead that's going to show up and say something outrageous. So I think it's more important to, to identify when it is that these people are saying something outrageous. And it's just outrageous. And teach everybody to detect outrageous statements. So let's look at some of the statements. Let's look at the NVIDIA CEO state. Here's a multiple choice question. Why did the NVIDIA CEO say that programmers are obsolete? A, because programmers are obsolete. B, because he mistakenly believes programmers are obsolete. C, because his stock crisis way hope hyperinflated and by saying something crazy and telling people that buying CPUs instead of humans will get his stock price even higher. So which of those two things is highly likely? And the answer is C. Well, I like C. Yeah, yeah we I'll all like C. Like C. Yeah. We, you and I yeah. see this stuff. Like tech bros are always saying stuff. Now, let's take the Devon thing. Here's another multiple choice question. The Devon announcement. Why was it? Because people are widely using Devon to write new software and replace people. A. Uh, B. Uh, because Devon has gone and written a million new things be, without even a, being asked to write a new thing. Or because that person is in pe between venture capital rounds and needs to yep. say something outrageous to their venture capitalists so that they yep. get their next venture capital round. And the answer is C, right? And so we have to just realize, and the Devon announcement was such a perfect tech bro pitch to venture capitalists that was total crap and fluff. I mean, absolute garbage. And, and so all these tech bros, they want to make some money. They want to fund their next thing. They want to up their stock price. They, something, they say something that is completely outrageous that they know is absolutely not true. They do a demo of something that they know doesn't scale. And yet then foolish people flow money to them. And, on, and so I think that the idea of dunking on these folks by giving a counterexample it's just a waste of time because it's like whack-a-mole. Every person yeah. who wants more venture capital is going to say something outrageous. And they're just going to keep doing it. Hype cycle, right? It's just a hype cycle. And it's just it's just the thing where I, I get it. They want the money. They just, every time they pop up and there's a bunch of them. But I just want your viewers to start thinking about, like, why are these people saying what they're saying? Why are these human beings? Yeah who are CEOs or running startups, why are they saying these things? Don't just assume that they're there for truth, right? They're not truth. They're not, their motivation has nothing to do with informing you. Their motivation has to do with their own company interests. Everyone, David Bumble back with Dr. Chuck. Dr. Chuck, it's fantastic to have you back on the channel. It's good to be back. So Dr. Chuck, we were talking offline very recently, Devon got released, new AI software engineer. You and I were talking previously about your trip to India and you, I think this is perfect timing. Perhaps you can tell us about, you know, the sky's falling, people are worried, end of software engineering jobs. Please give us your take and your advice. So I was, I was in a world to, whirlwind tour of India for 10 days, uh, six universities, right. three companies. And I was talking about, you need to be better programmers. And we talked about master programmer in previous, in previous sessions. And I was, the course is done. And I'm like, you need to be a master programmer. And yeah. then the inevitable question that came up at the end of the talk, and sometimes these are rooms with 2,000 people in them. The inevitable question that came up was like, wait. Why are you telling me yep. to be a better programmer when I don't even, we don't, we're being told right now that we're, it's pointless to be a programmer. And so yep. they, the thing that was driving them a week and a half ago was the quote from the NVIDIA CEO yep. that basically yep. said programmers were obsolete. And I knew this question yep. was coming. So I had yep. six times, more like 10 times to answer it. And so I, I, I was able to sort of like take a large audience and give one answer and then in the next 24 hours, give a different answer and then watch what answers like got the right reaction from the crowd. And by the end of it, I think I came up with an answer that sort of stunned them yep. and like really kind of hit home. And the first few answers are things you and I have talked about before, like how, you know, a mid-tier programmer, you know, 
can it'll come back with mid-tier programmer has no awareness of its mistakes. You know, I, I've been noticing my students, like I'm a savant helping my students on their homework assignments because I've seen everything once. And what I'm starting to see things I've never seen before. And it's kind of weird because like I can usually snap and see what's wrong with it. And this one woman who was a really good programmer and her solution to the actual assignment was one of the best I'd seen. Um, but she had something like deep in a configuration file later, it took me forever to find it, a deep in a configuration file. And I'm like, where did this come from? And so you start yeah. imagining that people who are sort of depending on these technologies are going to bake into their code base something wrong. And that's going to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then yeah. later, we're going to have to unwind it. Some Somebody who knows what's going on is going to have to like, wait wait, that's slow or that didn't work or it blows up once in five times or whatever. And someone's going to have to hunt that down, right? Uh, yep. And the initial programmer, you know, wasn't just a beginning program. So, you know, I talked about that. That was one of my sets of questions, right? About these little flaws that that come out of it. But then I went to uh, one university, the lovely professional university, and they took me on a tour of their aerospace area and they showed me some drone work that they're doing. And the thing that was going through my head was like, are we still working on drones? Are we still like doing drone research? I mean, you just go down to the store and say, give me a drone. And, and these guys were doing research on drones and it was their whole college thing. And, and, and I'm thinking to myself that I went back to the talk and, and I thought, now, couldn't we ask chat GPT or some AI to kind of just build a drone? And then I came up with the following idea. And that is, I don't know if you're old enough, David, but I remember when we started seeing kind of like such and so university in Zurich is trying to build these quadcopter things that use Wi-Fi and and inertial yep. things and and they're in these giant padded rooms and they would go up and crash and explode. And you know, of course now we just go buy a drone, right? But there was yep. a time, there was a time where the concept of this quadcopter with inertial checking and Wi-Fi and all this stuff and collision avoidance and a camera and all that stuff. That was just crazy futuristic research. Yeah. And so this is, this is what I said. I said, let's just imagine for once that we can take all these wonderful NVIDIA CPUs, as the NVIDIA guy says, is the solution to everything. Take that bunch of NVIDIA CPUs, right? Take a bunch of computers, take a whatever, and we pack them into like a couple of rolling suitcases and we get in a time travel machine and we go back to 2000. And then what we did, and the internet existed in 2000 and we turn on the NVIDIA processors and we run Llama for a while or whatever. And we sit there in 2000 and we let run, give everything that humanity knows to Llama in 2000 and it runs for a while. The lights dim and all those things. And yep. It runs for a while and Llama says, okay, I'm ready. And then in 2000, you say, I'd like to build a drone that flies automatically and has an, you know, that's got a joystick. Llama's going to say, drone? What's a drone? But if you do it that today, it'll be like, oh, and then there's inertial things and then there's this and yep. there's that. And, and so- the fallacy of all of it has to do with there are certain things that are being done faster and faster and faster. And these NVIDIA CPUs definitely do a thing faster, but it, they just always kind of say that somehow the creativity is growing. And the answer is the creativity is like zero and like it's gone up 50% and it's still zero, right? That there just is no future looking thing. And so I'm standing there in a lab talking to a student who's struggling with something in the future. And there's just yeah. nothing that AI can help with. Whatever the problem is, AI is a concept that comes from 1947, which is the first time I saw this concept. It's a, pro it's a thing called the Memex, which a fellow named Vannevar Bush, immediately after World War II, they had done a lot of sort of knowledge mapping and finding ways to use knowledge uh, to their advantage. And the thing that they... The, the Memex is a fictitious device that basically had to do with you, you go into a library and you put everything on microfilm and then you have a machine that you can watch people looking things up in microfilm. And what you do is you track where all the people go. You make connections between documents. They called them threads. So they'd have all these little threads of who read this one, then who read that one, and then who read the other thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Making connections between documents 
and capturing then the associations we're making in our minds as we're processing information and then gaining knowledge from those associations, right? And so yeah. the, the machine did not write the books. The machine did not read the books. The machine watched us reading the books okay. and intended to gain knowledge out of that. And you see that same thing from 1947 to present of, you know, the evolution of search engines. The first search engines they read the whole internet and they stuck it in a big database and then they looked at all the words and tried to make sense of those words in like Alta Vista and they were terrible. And then yeah. Google came out with PageRank and said, the words aren't so important, but the links are. And that's called PageRank yeah. and that's how Google got better. But really Google did not get better because of PageRank. All PageRank gave Google was five documents to show us. And then when we clicked on the third document, and when millions of people clicked on the third document, they moved the third document up to the first document. Again, go back to the notion of threads. It's yeah. our interaction with knowledge that then became something where Google is telling us, codifying, capturing the knowledge that we're generating as human beings, and then giving it back to us, right? And we're like, yeah. wow, you're awesome. I assume that means you're creative. And the answer is they still can't design a drone if the drone hadn't already been designed, right? And yep. you just keep going on and on and on. And then now you look at like all these large language models and they're magnificent. In a way, the future of, I mean, Google is in some trouble because the future of search is not links. They've been going a long time on links in websites and then our behavior. But if our behavior yep. stops asking Google questions and stops clicking on Google things, Google's going to be in a very bad place. And so what's cool is now this to me is absolutely the next generation of search engine in that we're going back to a uh, software that can begin to understand the actual nature of the documents and make the connections between the documents, which means this is like search engine times a million because we, we look at the documents and it's looking at the language, it's making all the connections. And it's going to be even more amazing when we start doing stuff with it. And I think that's the, the problem is, is that everyone wants to claim that it's a done deal and it just, it, it solves a problem today. And the answer is just like PageRank and, and search engines, this, the problem will be solved by us using it, right? And so that, that okay. this notion that we don't need to be there anymore and we don't need to click and we don't need to try things and we don't need to explore these things to make them smarter is, is a terrible mistake. That's basically what I told him is like, you know, they're, they're not future looking, they're not creative. And so we look at them and look at their speed and then we impute somehow creativity on top of that. And the answer is their creativity is not growing anywhere near as fast as their speed. Okay. So if I understand correctly, you're saying AI is great at looking at what we as humans did, speeding that process up, but can't invent new things. Yeah. It really can't anticipate what our next step is going to be. And, okay. you know, and I look at the software that I'm about to write and I look at the software that I have written, the stuff that I've written that I've worked on over 10 years, it took a path, it found a place. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that was the right idea. I, I, but as I was going forwards through that, I was never sure what the right idea was. And there's a lot yeah. of bad ideas that just kind of fell away. But looking backwards, you can see the right idea. And so the, the problem is, is that there's so many, there's right ideas and so many wrong ideas going forwards that it's difficult for AI to figure out that forward path. And so yeah. I would love to have some help on the work that I want to do going forward, but I just, I just can't imagine that the kind of problems that I'm solving, they're just unsolved problems, right? And so if it's an unsolved yeah. problem, I just don't see how AI can even come close to it. Like you can say, hey, build a crawler. Of course. Everybody builds crawlers and it's not hard. And so, yes, AI can is a savant at building crawlers, but that doesn't mean it's a savant at the kinds of things that good programmers have to do going forward. Yeah. When you hire someone to build a website, do you just want it to go back through all the websites of history and find you like somebody else's website and say, oh, there's your website. Like I changed the name. And the answer is no, yeah. you want there's something you want, something that's cool. Exactly. Or, uh, you know, think of when you go to Disney and you got these little wristbands and you hit the wristband. Now, that's a different application. And, and once it's been figured out by human beings, large language models can gain from whatever it is we document about that. But still, you know, and, and they can look at API documentation so much more rapidly than we can. And that's really cool. And they can generate 
you know, we don't, it, you know, instead of me sitting and looking at some sample JSON and writing some Java code for a couple of hours, they, I can just say, hey, write some Java code for this JSON. And that kind of stuff works great. It's just, it doesn't replace the programmer. So when you were in India, what was the reception to what you said? Because I love what you said, like there's hidden bugs. I think this is what you've said before, when you try to use AI to write code, I mean, code could have full of vulnerabilities and stuff. And then you spoke the drone example. What did your, did your audience counter any of your arguments or did they agree with you? So I would say that the best way to think about it is some of my early stuff about code bugs and whatever, they just didn't buy it. They, I mean, I, I, I didn't like win the room at that point. I mean, they were yeah. like, oh, you're yeah. a nice guy. You came from far away. So we'll listen to your question. The only one, the only thing where I felt like, uh, you know, mic drop after, you know, mic drop after it was all done, uh, yeah. that was when I talked about time travel, right? I talked about the fact yeah. that it's really hard to imagine not that it's not capable of looking forward until we force ourselves into a prior context where we know what happened, but we can easily see that the AI could never have predicted what was going to happen. So that felt like a mic drop moment where... You know, I felt like a mic drop moment where the room was kind of stunned. I mean, meaning they got the point when other times, all the other kind of slam, all the other dunks on AI that I did in other talks. And matter of fact, that's when I contacted you and says, let's talk. And I realized yeah. that I had sort of mic dropped yeah. the whole room with just an answer to the AI question. Yeah, it's good that you've got multiple arguments against it, right? Because the, the problem is always the hype cycle. There's so much noise. And uh, that's what I really appreciate about talking to someone like you, Dr. Chuck, because you've been doing this for a long time. There've been many hype cycles in in your lifetime, right? So, you know, separate the noise from the truth. Well, the other the other story that I I told them, and this didn't go over too well, and that is, I asked them to guess what year it was that I first heard the following statement that from a very respected computer scientist who was not lying had no reason to lie, said that computers are getting faster at such a rapid pace that within two years, programmers are not going to have to write software anymore. And so I saw that in a quote in a document, and you have to tell me what year it was that I first read the end of the end of the, end of of the life of programmers. No, I, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm assuming it was quite a while ago. Yes, it was 1978. Oh, no. Wow. Okay. Okay, I didn't think it was that far back. No, no, it was literally 1978 when I first heard that the end of pro- prediction of the end of programming, and it was a very short short time. What was going on in 1978 was computers were getting faster very rapidly. And again, yeah. this is the problem of speed increasing means that they're capable of doing things that we like them to do faster, but then we sort of like put creativity on the same curve as speed. And that's why yeah. I say, you know, in 1978, computers had a creativity of zero, and in 2000, computers had a creativity of zero, and in 2024, computers have a creativity of zero, and all they're doing is like finding the trails that of the information that we've laid down for them and looking at those trails better than we can look at those trails. But their creativity and, uh, and future look has been zero since 1978, and no matter how much we increase that creativity. If it starts at zero, it's just not going up. And so that's the problem is that we just give too much credit for doing cool things faster. And we just huh. assume that creativity is coming along and it's really not. So AI is going to be an assistant to programmers, but not a replacement. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, there is just no question about AI. I mean, yeah. it, because it's a language model, which is a whole new technology on the scene, it is going to make searching obsolete. I mean, what, what really is going to happen is searching is going to be obsolete because of AI. And the key thing is, is that because AI can look at all the documents, make reasonable connections with the documents before we tell it what documents are important, it can... It yeah. can construct a sense of the importance of information where search engines could never do that. Re- search engines could yeah. never really be informed about the meaning within documents, whereas large language models can look at documents and extract meaning and then make connections that we didn't show them. And that's why I say Google is the thing that's most worrisome because Google has never produced a business model for anything other than search and advertising. And I think, you know, I, just like Alta Vista went on the dust heap when PageRank came out. I think if yeah. Google can't figure this out, then Google's going to be on the dust heap. I seriously. No, I love that. I think it's, this is why Microsoft, uh, I'm assuming from what I've heard, have inv- has invested so much money into open AI because this is where they can beat Google. I, I completely agree with that. 
I completely agree with it. And and here's the other thing. I don't think anybody knows what it's exactly going to look like that is the Google Beater, yeah. right? Because we're seeing such simple stuff. It's like we're we're playing with a debugger interface to chat GPT right now, right? That, yeah. That's still not <laughs> yeah. the interface that replaces search. And maybe Devin is kind of a new thing, but I think they're they're barking up the wrong tree, right? I mean, you know, I think maybe GitHub's Copilot is a smarter thing, right? Where where it's like, dude, you, I think you're typing something right now, and man, I got a feeling I can help you, right? And you know that, and yeah. again, who's GitHub? Microsoft, right? And yeah. and and GitHub Copilot, where it's like, dude, you don't even type the search request. I'm just watching what you're doing, and I can help. And that's going to be cool. That's not creative. That's not forward looking. That's just simultaneously while you're doing something, you know, it's like you got augmented reality and these things are popping up from your like augmented reality assistant. And it's like, yeah. dude, looks like you're parsing some JSON in Java. I know a lot about that. You want me to help? You know, and that's going to yeah. be awesome. And, 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 uh, you know, the problem there is like, I had this problem where I was fixing a, the window uh, switch in my car because the uh, wires got messed up in my race car. Right. Yeah. And, and it took me, three weeks before I found the pigtail, the little plug, right? And so here I am searching and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm doing this da 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 yeah. And it turned out I went to this website called findpigtails.com and I searched and I tried that. And then they said, if you're having trouble, click on this little chat icon down at the bottom. And I clicked on the chat icon and it was not artificial intelligence. It was a human being. And I said, I'm having a problem with that. I bought this thing. It's the wrong thing. I bought another thing. And he said, well, just send a picture, like in the chat. And I sent a picture in the chat. And this human being, like within five seconds, says, that's a, that's a P2704. And here's a link to it in our website. And I'm like, whoa, it's right. Now, all their AI, I'd sent pictures to their AI, and it didn't do it. Um, and this person in less than 10 seconds, recognized it and told me what to do. And so I can imagine that person's like my little helper, right? He's just like a little thing that pops up and helps me out. Just, you know, if if the darn browser had been watching my searches for two weeks trying to solve this yeah. dang problem when I say yeah. 2009 Ford Mustang door switch pigtail and just like, dude, looks like you're having some trouble here. I'm a helper over here. You're, I'm your assistant. I'm just watching you struggle. You know, yeah. if you just let me know, I'll help you on this, right? And if that that thing then was as smart as that human being turned out to be, I think that's how we're going to write software, right? It's like I see you struggling, you know. I I see that you're you're reading this Python code and your cursor has stopped on this one line for a while. Are you struggling a little bit? Do you want me to? Is there anything I can help you here? And then it'll help you, but that doesn't mean it's smarter than you. Or when it's done helping you, it's not going to know what the next line is. And so I think it's I think it's a gloriously exciting time, you know, for programmers. It's a gloriously exciting time, but it is not the time to stop learning software development. I'm glad you said that. I have to be cynical for one second or make or you make make a make a really bad joke. It's it's as if Microsoft Paperclip has now finally become useful, right? You know, I I think about Microsoft Paperclip probably far too often, right? And, 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 and it's things like, uh, hype cycles. There's all kinds yep. of things that talk about hype and, and like you travel a lot, you have a lot of busy things. You, you're trying to figure out when it is that you can even go on vacation. And one of the things that the paper, like clip, clip, like creature was supposed to do is to look at your like whole life and look at yep. all your calendars and watch you perhaps while you're searching for a flight, say, David. Uh, I see you're searching for a flight on April 9th. You yeah. do know, right, that your your brother-in-law's birthday is on April 9th, and you've already agreed to go there, okay? So, so that again, that's the paperclip, right? Just like, yep. I'm here to help you. I'm your little administrative assistant. And, I mean, the paperclip was just bad. And that's not saying that all little yep. chats in the lower right-hand corner of a website are good. No, 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 no. Some are terrible way worse than humans. The one I liked was actually a real human and it was impressive and surprising how smart that human was. And so, yeah, that, it is paperclip. I have to agree with you that, uh, you know, the idea of paperclip is coming back around. But you said, I just want to circle back. You said that it's a very exciting time to get into software development. So if, if you were talking to your, your younger self or, you know, these people that you spoke to, you're still recommending to become a developer, right? Oh, absolutely. 
And I'm recommending that you become the, the master master developer where you, instead of trying to yeah. learn everything, you try to learn a depth of understanding. And the one way that I described it um, when I was describing the, the master programmer experience is that the difference between a, a regular programmer and a master programmer is the fact that and when, when I'm looking at syntax on a screen, I see an entire three-dimensional, ever-evolving set of pictures behind the screen of these things connected to that thing, the memory's working, the operating system's working, the network's working, yeah. the compiler's working, the runtime environment's working. And so when I write one line of code, there's like all these things that are simultaneously happening behind it. And the problem is if you just think of code as syntax and you don't understand code as a kind of living creature that operates in some kind of complex environment, well, you you don't know how to do that. And so my suggestion would be don't spend a year learning React. Don't spend a year learning Angular. Don't spend a year learning C++. Don't, whatever it is, AI will help you with that. But if you have no understanding what computers are or what they do, then AI can't help you. And so this is where the thing we talked about in the path of the master programmer is learn fewer things, but learn them better and take the time to learn them yeah. deeply so that when you're being advised kind of from the side, you're, you know how to take that advice and you know the meaning of that advice and you know you can separate good advice from bad advice because you see everything uh, in a deeper way. And, you know, looking at your expertise in, you know, networking, you when you're looking at the syntax of a Cisco configuration command, you're not just going like, that's characters. You're like, oh, yeah, and that's like a line sure. and a wire and things are moving back and forth and you see protocols happening. Yep. You know, when you're typing a thing, and that's the difference between sort of a, a master network configurator person and just a person that's typing stuff and doesn't understand that yep. that's really a, an abstraction of a very complex, yep. very deep picture that the best people know the picture. So, uh, so David, the, the main purpose of my trip to India was to talk about the path to the master programmer. And I think this is kind of yep. a hard sell. And I think I'm really, really passionate about it. Um, I have for the past 10 years been giving people their introductory programming courses online through Coursera and elsewhere by teaching Python to yeah. 3 million people, 1 million of which are in India. And lately I've been thinking more about like, not like how you get used to programming, but instead how do you get a job? And so that's where the master programmer comes in. The master programmer comes into what I value in an employee. And I kind of I kind of summarized it this way. And that is, if you imagine you're a senior in computer science right now and you're going to go into a job market and you look at all the possible technologies that you should know, there's probably 25 to 30 of things that you might touch in the first three years of your job. There's no way a college can teach you all 25 or 30 of those things without you waiting until you're 35 years old. And then the problem is, is as soon yeah. as you graduate, the thing you're going to work on isn't even one of those 30 things that we taught you. So we just have to accept the fact that college can't really prepare you for the job. And I started thinking about like people that I've known who are older and have been doing this for a long time and none of their education really prepared them for the exact skills. And then I kind of realized that the most valuable thing that I see in a programmer that I like adore them because of this feature and that is any programmer that I like can walk into a new situation and say, hi, uh, we're using Angular. I apologize. We started this project a while back. We're using Angular and we're using a, this and we're using a Ruby in the back end. And yeah. the people that are good, they're like, okay, tell me where to check it out. I'll go read the Ruby documentation. I've never done Ruby and I've never done Angular. I'll go read the Angular documentation. And what happens is after a month, not only is the good person up to speed on Angular and Ruby, if that's what it has to be. They're one of the strongest people on the team with Angular and Ruby because they're coming from a deep understanding of how computers and software work. And so it's the, so it's like, yeah. if, you, if you're not ready to learn a new thing in four weeks, you have not been well prepared with your education. And our job as educators is to prepare people to learn new things and master them in four weeks. So then I'm looking yeah. at a curriculum that says, not, I'm going to try to teach you everything you're ever going to see in the marketplace, but I'm going to try to say, what are the foundational concepts that you need to know? And that's when all of a sudden C becomes important. C becomes important because 
C is the way you explain all the other languages. And so if a person yeah. really is good at C and understands pointers and how memory management works and how operating system works and, and how networks work, you can literally say, oh, Angular, that's, that's four weeks. And Ruby, that's yeah. four weeks. So that's where the path to the master programmer is. It's trying to come up with the fewest possible courses that can lead a person to this moment where we drop them into a job situation four weeks, four weeks later, they know whatever it is they need to know. And they become not only a capable contributor, but a leader in that project. And so uh, I came down to, uh, and we've talked about what the curriculum is, and I keep changing it every time we talk, yeah. but the latest version of the curriculum that I came up with is Python, C, computer hardware, architecture kinds of stuff, and SQL is the four most basic things, which is like 12 college credits. And then the next three are HTML, JavaScript, and Java. And I, my theory is, is that's like 21 credits, which basically a half a year. If you master those, not just take a crappy course on the syntax from a teacher who really doesn't even understand those language, but you walk in as a master of those things, there is nothing you can't learn. There's just nothing in programming that you can't learn uh, once you're there. The other thing that's come to me, and, and part of the Part of the, if you go back and you look at our previous things, I, I don't like teaching JavaScript, but JavaScript has moved into my core thing, but Angular and React are not, right? And so people teach JavaScript and the problem with JavaScript is it's just such a wretched language or historically has been such a wretched language that we got to build hundreds and hundreds of frameworks to make it useful. But those frameworks yeah. are themselves short-lived. And so, yeah, there's a lot of React programmers out there, but React is kind of legacy at this point. And what's really cool is that the JavaScript community is slowly but surely looking at things like jQuery, React, Angular, all the ones that get popular and say to themselves, how can we pull those features into JavaScript itself, right? Instead of yeah. like, oh yeah, Angular's the answer or Svelte's the answer and then fighting between Angular and Svelte. No. The, the, the actual browser developers, the companies that make browsers are like, that's a good feature for React. How about we just like put it in the browser by default, but clean it up a little bit. And so yeah. I'm beginning to see a JavaScript class that has like a 10 year shelf life because there's no such thing as a JavaScript or even a Java class that has a 10 year shelf life. And I don't like building courses yeah. that have two year shelf lives. I mean, people can go on Udemy yeah. and put up a thing on React 12 and, and Angular 92 and whatever. And they got, you know, they got like a six month shelf life because then a new version comes out and they'll go make a little money on, yeah. you know, Angular N plus one. I don't do those kind of classes. I'm trying to kind of create the classics. I'm trying to say this because yeah. I, I build a course that has a 50 year shelf life. Right. This is a 50 year old programming <laughs> yeah. language. And, and, and so if it's 50 years old, it's got a 50 year shelf life. Python is 25 years old. So it has a 25 year shelf life, you know, and I don't tend to do things that just got invented last year. Cause usually if something was invented last year, it has like a one year shelf life from a, from a teaching. And so I don't, I put so much love, energy and devotion into every single class I create. I don't want it to have a two year shelf life. If it was a crap class, yep. sure, I'll make a little money. It's crap. And uh, so I look for things that are truly permanent and are the basis of like a, a deep truth in computing. And I'm beginning to think that in the next two years, JavaScript is going to be so good that it's not going to change then for five to 10 more years. And things like Angular and React will just slowly fade away, just like jQuery is slowly fading away. I really want to thank you, Dr. Chuck, for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. And also you'd like separating the hype because that's the big thing, right? People see all this hype, the sky's falling and they worry. But not only are you doing that, but you're also giving people the opportunity who haven't got money to learn this stuff for free. So I've put those links below. Dr. Chuck, as always, thank you so much. Thank you.